Good evening. My name is Jack Leonard, and I would like to welcome you to the ninth in the lecture series associated with our spring semester Master of Landscape Architecture Interdisciplinary Studio, 100 Year Coastal Resilience Studio, Hampton, Virginia. I hope that you enjoyed our last guest lecture in the series, Nathan Hevers, who presented Temperate Close Coastal Planting Strategies for Landscapes in Flux. If you missed Nathan's lecture or any future lectures, you can watch them on the School of Architecture and Planning YouTube channel. Our guest lecture this evening is Alex Dar. This evening, his topic will be stream and riparian corridor restoration in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Alex Dar is a landscape ecologist, arborist, and lecturer in the Morgan State University graduate program in landscape architecture, teaching field courses and plant identification. His expertise includes urban forestry, ecological restoration, landscape management, GIS, and community engagement. Alex is an ecological restoration specialist with Fairfax County, Virginia, assessing natural communities, managing field surveys, and overseeing large-scale landscape restorations. He holds a BS in urban forestry and a Master of Landscape Architecture. Please welcome Alex Dar. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, I appreciate you all having me here tonight for this lecture. Um, it's really a topic I'm excited to uh, discuss with you all. Um, like Jack said, I'm a landscape ecologist with Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, for those of you not aware, not familiar with the area, as a largely urbanized county uh, just outside of Washington, D.C., um, large land, large area, um, but again, very highly fragmented natural resources, uh, very highly developed, large impervious surface area, um, and very uh, low, typically low quality, low condition uh, remaining natural resources. The office that I work with is in the Department of Public Works and Environmental Services, and we work in stream and riparian corridors to restore habitat, restore function of, of waterways, um, and restore ecosystems, largely for the purposes of water quality improvement, um, nutrient and sediment pollution runoff reduction, um, but also for the kind of the underlying purposes of restoring habitat and increasing abundance of native species, abundance and diversity of native species. So we talk about ecological restoration and what we're looking at, uh, you know, what, what we mean when we say that is that we are attempting to return a natural area to a condition where it will be able to support itself and sustain itself uh, through disturbances um, and, ongo and the ongoing change that is inherent in nature. So we're not trying to achieve any particular steady state of ecosystem. Um, we more try to achieve a diversity and a functional health that allows the ecosystem to respond to disturbance um, without kind of seeing any cascading effects uh, that result in undesirable outcomes. So in the East Coast, you know, kind of general mid-Atlantic, um, probably all are familiar with this sort of timeline. Um, this is kind of an outmoded way, or kind of an older fashioned way of thinking, um, but you know, it, it largely still holds true. Um, this is a pattern of succession that we tend to see, you know, in, in mid-Atlantic areas. Uh, after a field is plowed or, or cut, you proceed from grassland through shrubland, pine forest, into a kind of a, an oak hickory diverse system. Of course, disturbance can come in periodically through, at any point in the series um, and revert it back to an earlier stage. It's not that we get to a final, uh, final form where this stays forever. Um, this is just kind of within a human lifespan, kind of what we can see. So we like to point to some success stories um, of what, you know, what's possible. I, I look at Shenandoah National Park. Uh, this was a national park established around 1930 uh, in the Shenandoah Mountains in Virginia. It was largely clear cut, largely farmland um, that was really low quality natural resource, low diversity, poor soils. Uh, you know, not not much forest canopy to speak of. Over years and years of plowing um, and and timber harvest, we've see, we saw a lot much of the soil wash off the mountains, off these steep slopes, 
uh, pastures were overgrazed. Uh, really, the land was was exploited. Um, after those disturbances were removed, uh, both through passive and active restoration efforts, you know, we see this national park that that we're familiar with today, where we see widespread biodiversity, widespread forest cover, and a and a generally healthy, resilient ecosystem, uh, including rare plants. You know, won't go into specifics on these guys. Um, but once the container is sort of created and uh, disturbances, kind of negative disturbances are taken away, we see natural recovery start to take its charge. So some threats that we're facing uh, to natural communities that, that prompt us to consider restoration for a site um, are shown on this slide. We have human land conversion. This is just general development, whether agricultural or kind of urban commercial residential development. Uh, oversimplification. Uh, this is kind of the loss of biodiversity. Biodiversity tends to help keep natural cycles flowing. You can have one species uh, be, be lost due to some form of disturbance, whether it's uh, fire, um, natural disaster, pests, diseases, you know, a new thing that comes in and feeds on selectively. But with biodiversity, with enough biodiversity, you tend to have other species kind of fill that balance. In today's urbanized systems, we tend to see dramatic oversimplification, you know, maybe 10% of the, the plants that would have been kind of present in any given species matrix um, remain as the, as the predominant species. Uh, we have invasive species of fungi, plants, uh, insects. These are species that were not, didn't co-evolve with the natural communities that, that are present in the areas that we're working in um, and can often uh, in short time frames can create cascades of uh, unpredictable sorts of changes within those ecosystems. We have deer herbivory, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and then we have natural, natural events, hurricanes, floods, fires. Uh, these can be pretty incredible disturbance events that uh, you know, on a large enough time frame and a large enough scale, natural areas can recover from them. But when we have, when we face the fragmentation and all of the other threats that are faced to these natural communities, um, oftentimes recovery from these events is not feasible in a short time frame. So zooming way, way out, just kind of putting putting all this into perspective, putting putting our species in perspective. Now this is just a little infographic of of kind of all the biomass on Earth. So we consider each one of these blocks to be a ton of carbon. Um, every life form on Earth makes up 550 gigatons. That's 550, I don't even know, million, billion tons, a whole lot. Anyway, um, and when we look down here at the bottom, you see that humans are 0.06 of that. It's 0.06 gigatons of carbon compared to 450 of plants. Plants are by far the predominant biomass on, on Earth and are the kind of underlying the ecological communities. All the nutrient cycling, all of the natural cycles that exist that keep life on Earth moving um, rely on plants. Plants are the primary producers, taking energy from the sun, photosynthesizing it, bringing minerals and nutrients out of the Earth and making them available uh, to living things. So, you know, by, by weight, humans are fairly insignificant when we look at ourselves next to, you know, for example, 12% of the biomass on Earth is bacteria. As I said, 82% of the biomass is plants. Humans make up 0.01% of that. Uh, so, you know, we're outweighed by insects, we're outweighed by fish, um, just about every other form of life. But as I'm sure you all are aware, we have a dramatically outsized impact on the ecosphere. Looking at kind of the, you know, how we've affected the array of, of, of life on Earth. Uh, the gray squares on this diagram are humans, they're us. The light gray squares are all of our pets and livestock. And then the green squares here are all the wild animals. Um, so you can see that livestock just exponentially has, has uh, overtaken all of the wild animals on planet Earth, you know, at a 10 to 1 ratio. So our efforts to change the land use, 
domesticating animals, um, you know, has massively displaced and, and reshaped how all of our ecosystems function. So, you know, there are effects to all, to all these changes. This has happened on an incredibly rapid time scale when you consider the rate of natural evolution um, and natural changes to the planet. Um, so, you know, of course, ecosystems have, have responded in, in all sorts of different ways with that. Climate change is another major threat that we're facing, um, and a you know a reason that we look look to rest look to ecological restoration to create resilient, diverse communities. Um, this is just showing where, you know where some of the threats, major threats to climate change, are you know distributed throughout the earth. You know, fortunately, where we are, we're in one of these nice green areas. Um, you know, as long as you're not on the coast, maybe maybe you know just go inland from Baltimore a little bit. Um, but temperate regions. Um, because of the species diversity, um, because of their isolation from from most natural disasters, you know, are are, are relatively safer. Um, you know, we face a tremendous crisis of biodiversity loss. We've lost half of terrestrial vegetation since agriculture was developed. Humans have plowed and deforested just about every habitat, every ecosystem that that we've become dominant in. You know, we've lost about 20% of the species on Earth since humans have, have, have developed agriculture. 75% fewer wild animals. Um, and, you know, we've just had an had a incredibly massive impact on Earth, um, largely without kind of planning ahead um, for those impacts. When we had much smaller populations and lower technology 10,000 years ago, those changes are, you know, could, could easily be sustainable. Um, today, with the with global trade, with rising populations, with increases in industrialized agriculture and different land use changes, um, we really need to think ahead to the impacts that we're having on natural communities. And we are in the midst of a mass extinction. Over a million species on Earth faced with ex extinction. Almost all the coral, coral reefs will be gone within all of our lifetimes. Um, half a million insect species are faced by extinction. And, you know, I just include this with, within Virginia, out of the 2,500 species that we have of plants, you know, about a quarter of those are, have become rare. Um, and, uh, you know, that wasn't always the case. So I don't say all this to, you know, say that we face insurmountable challenges. I say this to, you know, just kind of show the stakes of what we're working with. You know, we, we face really tremendous challenges, um, but it is the role of planners and designers in this in this future that we're facing uh, to develop creative solutions, to make good choices um, for how urban areas um, and communities are planned and developed in the future. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the challenges and some of the considerations that are made when we look at natural area restoration, um, when we look at ecological restoration, the the focus of my my particular role and my work is in stream and riparian restoration. Um, but we're going to zoom out a little bit before we get before we get into the nitty gritty of that, um, and just kind of look at what landscape architects should be prepared to some of the challenges that landscape architects should be prepared for when you're considering working in a natural area with the goal of ecological restoration. And again, ecological restoration, well, when, I, when I say that, we're taking degraded systems with low biodiversity, low ecosystem functioning, um, low ability to naturally cycle nutrients and face, just face the disturbances that are present within all these systems um, and enhance those to the point where they are uh, more biodiverse, more productive in terms of biomass, and more able to support all the different species um, that are present within our, within our natural areas. Um, so one massive change that we've seen, you know, really just in the past hundred years is explosions in deer population. Uh, deer were once a subsistence food for people all across the country. Uh, you know, for the, as long as there have been people in North America, basically, deer have been a subsistence food. Um, in addition to hunting impacts, there were once widespread predators uh, in our area um, that fed on deer. You know, we had wolves, we had mountain lions. Um, those species have largely been wiped out from the East Coast. 
Um, and along with that, people don't really, you know, for the most part, people don't rely on deer as a food source anymore. Uh, hunting has declined very rapidly. Um, and so in response to the lack of these, uh, these predators or these uh, forces keeping deer populations in check, we've seen populations just explode. Uh, some estimates in, that we work with in Fairfax County is that in order to get the deer population to a sustainable level, about 25,000 deer would have to be removed from the herd every year for five years. Um, the, average, uh, the average harvest by hunters in Fairfax currently is about 1,100 deer per year. So we're about 20 times short of where we need to be um, in order to reach a sustainable population. That would have been, you know, the population that would have been there say 300 years ago when there were predators and, uh, and more hunters in, in play. So what are the, some of the impacts of that? You know, we see this forest, this is a perfectly ordinary looking forest, probably to people who are used to walk, um, you know, experiencing nature in urban, suburban areas. Um, but what we're missing is any understory layer, um, any herbaceous layer on the ground cover, you know, any sort of perennials. Um, this is not how a, how a forest would have looked 400 years ago. Um, we would have had widespread ground cover. We would have had mature trees taking up the canopy and then, you know, a healthy, diverse understory stand. Um, just to show some impacts, most perennials and grasses, they can withstand about half of their biomass being, being grazed. You know, deer were present when all these plants were evolving. You know, all sorts of herbivorous animals were present uh, when all these plants were evolving. Uh, so the plants can handle a certain amount of grazing. Uh, but once we get to the 70% to 90% loss of the above ground portions of these, roots stop growing um, and eventually these species are lost. Just moving through here. And you can see what I wanted to show in this is just kind of this, we call it a hedging effect, where you see there are woody plants present, um, but they are clipped off year by year um, so they never really have the chance to mature into a into a healthy forest stand. Um, so without planning for this for these impacts caused by by herbivores, um, we don't really see ecosystems pro, pro, uh, progress along that trajectory that I outlined at the beginning of this slide. Um, some natural communities you can see there is you know a green understory here, um, and we have a some some green herbaceous layer, and we have some green shrub layer. Uh, but when we zoom in closer, um, this is an exotic plant called a uh, euonymus uh, burning bush. Um, it's not palatable to deer. You know, they leave it alone. Um, so there's kind of this natural selection that happens where certain species of plants that are not palatable take over an entire ecosystem. And we don't see the, um, the natural diversity that we would find in an area. You know, and additionally, this is a this plant didn't evolve with all of our native insects and songbirds, um, so there's not as not really a whole lot of food value in this plant. Um, the we'll get into it a little bit more later. Some of the implications of that, um, and so we're facing this this carrying capacity dilemma. You know, when this is a native sweet bay magnolia here on the in this in this slide, um, this tree cannot survive. You know, being constantly browsed, constantly grazed, it's never going to achieve maturity, it's never going to create flowers, it's never going to create seeds, you know, with this constant pressure on it. Um, and at the same time, the deer herd is basically starving itself out of available food. So the plants are suffering and the animals are suffering. Um, so this is something, you know, it, it, it's an undeniable fact that this is a challenge that designers have to face and have to plan for. You know, if we hope to restore natural communities to any sort of functional state. Just some real brief background. I was, you know, there's been a lot of study on this. Um, I mentioned about 100 years ago, white-tailed deer were not really present in eastern forests. You know, maybe one percent of where the current populations are now. Um, but kind of in the post-war time frame, hunting really fell out of favor as, as uh, urban communities grew, more people moved into the city and into the suburbs. Um, and, you know, since then, populations have just skyrocketed. So what are some options? You know, I, I mentioned hunting. Uh, scientists consider that probably the most effective way to uh, reduce the herd. 
but obviously it's not always tolerated in in all sorts of areas. Um, so we look to deer fencing as a as a option. Very expensive, um, requires maintenance, but it works. Um, deer have been known to jump over eight feet tall, uh, over over an eight foot tall fence. So you need substantial, significant fencing in order to keep an area um, free of deer and allow for plants to recover. This picture here in the top right shows the effects of a deer exposure in natural areas. Um, this is just passive regeneration. There was no replanting done here. Um, the, the right half of this was where the natural deer herd was, was free, to re free to roam. The left side of this image uh, where deer were excluded and natural regeneration was allowed to take place. So you can see just a really tremendous impact that a fence can have. Um, so this is, you know, when we're looking at large areas of restoration, something has to be done. You know, we can't, we're never going to achieve our, our goals of, of restoring functional forests uh, and prairies, shrublands, you know, any of these sort of, sort of systems uh, without planning ahead for this. Um, for this particular challenge. Um, some of the plant selections that you make can also have an effort, uh, have an impact. A lot of, there are a handful of native species, usually the ones that you see in the woods these days that are not palatable. Uh, pawpaws are one of them, uh, beech trees are one of them. Um, but, you know, we don't want to reduce all out of, the out of the thousands of native plants that we have available to us. You know, we don't want to reduce our selection to just the three or four things that deer aren't going to eat. Um, so we look at when we're planting these, the, the size of the plants that we're choosing. Um, these are two stream restorations right next to each other that my office worked on. Um, on the left, we used uh, plants that were grown in containers. Uh, these are, you know, maybe a three-year-old plant. They come in three or four feet tall with a healthy intact root system uh, in a fertilized ball of soil. And on the right, these are planted bare root. Uh, these are kind of 18 inch seedlings um, without that soil with, uh, you know, that have been removed from the ground without the soil um, around their root ball, a lot of root loss. And you see pretty tremendous difference. You know, this was the one on the left is five years later, the one on the right is three years later. Um, but you see that if you can give the plants a head start, sometimes they can get up above where a deer's mouth can reach. You know, once once you're above four and a half, five feet or so, um, deer aren't gonna, aren't gonna be able to reach that, that the, the terminal bud, the growing point of the tree. Whereas planting with 18 inch tall trees, you know, we see they can come by, graze that every single year, every single season, you know, multiple times a season. Um, and that restoration, that, that kind of natural regeneration can't really ever kickstart. Um, we face threats from invasive species. And, you know, this is a, very thoroughly talked about topic. I'm not going to go too far in depth on it. Um, but, you know, there are just tremendous impacts. This is um, Bradford pear, calorie pear, you see. We see it a lot in Northern Virginia and and, uh, and, and Maryland, um, where whole old fields have been overtaken by one, this one species of plant. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not going to dwell on this topic in particular, um, but it's important to know, it's important to consider that not only are these kind of creating habitats where it's more difficult for native species to take hold, um, what we see is that most insects um, have evolved pretty close relationships with particular host plants. Um, when those host plants are no longer available, uh, those insects are not able to feed, not able to reproduce. Implications of that, you lose insect diversity, um, but you also lose that uh, that link in the food chain, you know, where songbirds, mammals, um, amphibians, reptiles, they may very well be reliant on particular larvae, particular insects. And so you can see how when that chain starts to break down, um, there can really be cascading effects that go down the way. You know, it's not just that we don't like things that are from a from another place, but it's, you know, because it's because it's not didn't evolve here, it's it's inherently bad. Um, you know, we're kind of thinking in the broad ecological community that community sense where we want diversity. Um, we want to keep that food chain intact. Um, so we lose diversity when natural areas are, are overtaken by one particular species. Um, as designers, there are ways to combat these challenges. 
um, mechanical cu- mechanical removal of the plant through cutting, uh, through mowing, through uh, tilling. Uh, fire used to be present in basically everywhere on the East Coast. You would undergo periodic fire every five to ten years or so. Uh, all of these, all of our natural ecosystems, kind of evolved to handle that and to and to prosper in in those kind of conditions. Um, and that has ceased in the past five or in the past, you know, say 100, 100 to 200 years. Grazing can often keep a lot of these species in, in check. Um, people have, there's, there's all sorts of kind of boutique businesses that have popped up where goats are brought onto a site um, to control woody vegetation. They kind of specialize in woody, but in eating woody, woody vegetation. Um, so you can eliminate invasive woody plants while leaving the herbaceous community intact. And of course, there's chemical application. Um, faces a lot of uh, growing, I would say, public concern about the potential health impacts. Um, and with that growing public concern is political pushback, um, resulting in some states banning the use of herbicides on public lands. It's one of the, it's, it's, I see it as one of the tools in our tool chest. Often it's the most economical strategy for removing invasive species. Um, so, you know, personally, I, I work to keep those bans from being in place um, and, and try to, you know, just stay up on best practices for safely applying the proper chemicals in the proper doses um, to achieve the goals that we're looking for. Um, so fire, like I said, the fire is a tool that designers and land managers can use. This is a uh, carpet grass, an invasive carpet grass called Arthraxon, which takes over meadows in, on the East Coast. Um, this was at a Fairfax County Park where we did a controlled burn, uh, managed burn to remove this annual plant. You know, annual meaning it, it uh, reproduces via seed and grows back from a fresh new plant every year. Um, it doesn't establish roots that are stick around year after year. Um, so we did a managed burn here to that understory, uh, reduce, you know, eliminate that year's seed crop of that invasive plant. And what we see, this was, say, year zero before these impacts, before we did the fire. Um, this is year three. And you can start to see this patchiness, this clumpiness, where we have different habitats, different uh, different diverse uh, plant communities starting to establish themselves. This is a picture of that. And, you know, we've got, we see just in this picture, probably 10 different species of grasses, all sorts of herbaceous, uh, you know, flower, wildflowers. Um, and the, you notice the tree stand is still in place from that. What looks like a pretty significant amount of fire, um, again, because most of our native plants, native trees are evolved to handle periodic burns, um, that tree stand is still in place. It still, still provides that structural and functional, um, uh, all, all of those structural and, and, and functional uses for, for the ecosystem. All right, so I'm gonna move along a little bit, um, talk a little bit more about the, the stream restoration aspect in particular, uh, because you're all working with water systems, you're working with coastal resiliency. Um, so it's important to think at the beginning of the project, um, having some long-term planning, goal setting, you know, analyzing some of the challenges and uh, some of the opportunities that you'll face on, the, on any particular site can't just, it's easy to say that, you know, we want this to be a natural, healthy, old growth forest 50 years from now, um, but we have to plan at day zero for how we're gonna get there. So all, you know, just I'm not gonna go through all of this in particular, just take, just take a look at some of what we're, um, you know, what we're considering. We wanna have a long-term goal in mind for, for so what we wanna achieve, but um, we need to, trace out a trajectory for how, how that's going to get there. We need to set goals that what we want this to look like at year five, year 10, year 20, um, so that we can know that we're on the right trajectory. Um, there's a technique of adaptive management where, you know, say at year five, we're not on the trajectory that we thought we were going to be um, to reach our goal. Uh, we need to come up with some ideas for how are we going to either change, 
change our mind about what our long-term plan is, you know, where we're, where, what we were able to achieve in 50 years, um, or we need to start making some management decisions to change what we're currently doing so we can put ourselves back on that proper trajectory. We need to consider some of, you know, why are we doing this? Are we just doing this for the benefit of insects and fungi and bacteria, um, which have their own intrinsic value, in my opinion, which is, you know, a perfectly valid goal. Um, however, that's most, that's almost never the case for a restoration project. You know, we look for, uh, these are multi, many, many multi-million dollar projects on very large pieces of land with very large um, labor inputs into them. Um, so most of the time when those budgets are, are created, you know, we have in mind that we are doing this for water quality, we're doing this for wildlife habitat, or we're doing this for uh, agriculture, silviculture, meaning forestry, uh, recreational opportunities, community health, um, and aesthetics. So these are all things that landscape architects should be considering, you know, when you're putting your studio project together. Um, what are the particular goals you're looking for? It's, it's challenging to say, you know, like, you know, these are all perfectly good things to reach for. Um, but you may not be able to successfully achieve, you know, 10 different long-term goals. You may want to, by focusing in on three or four goals, uh, you may have a more cohesive, more um, successful project in the long run. Going to move along. Sorry, skip a couple things. Um, I think that in addition to talking about how we're going to achieve our restoration goals, it's important to also think about just preservation. When there are intact communities currently existing, it's very difficult for us to put those back, you know, to any sort of good condition. Restoration is a very slow process. It's a very expensive process. Um, and so we look for where we're going to make impacts, where we're going to make development impacts um, through my office. We look for the very poorest conditions um, because we know that we have a good shot at improving that. If we're in anything that's like average or better condition, we try to keep try our best to keep our hands off of it because just to get it, you know, we're going to take it back to zero when we start a construction or development project there, and to get it back to that 50% mark to average, um, you know, it's going to take millions of dollars and decades. Um, so. Preservation is one of the most important um, tools that we have in our tool chest. Just making wise decisions about where developments are, avoiding greenfield impacts, you know, making our impacts where there has already been um, environmental degradation um, is, is a really crucial planning tool. Just looking at kind of what the, this is an idea of what the challenges face in our soils, which support all these plants that, that, that we're trying to get to grow so that they can support insects, so that they can support birds and mammals and humans eventually. Um, you know, this is a totally normal new development site. You can see every bit of topsoil, every plant, every animal scraped off, removed from the site, probably sold. The topsoil is, you know, topsoil is a valuable resource, probably sold off. Um, this incredible compaction, you can see what I'm showing in this picture is just that you only see root growth in about the top two or three inches of soil. Everything below that, compacted, straight mineral soil, no, very, very little sort of biological activity taking place there. You see this again, this is just an average, any any normal, totally normal turf area that you'll see in an urban or suburban area. Again, you see root growth, top three, maybe three inches of soil, below that, essentially biologically sterile, um, just mineral soil that's not really supporting uh, a, a, an appreciable amount of, of biodiversity. Just a nice chart to kind of blow your mind a little bit. Um, in healthy old growth forest soil, you'll see up to 40 miles of, in just a teaspoon of soil, you'll see up to 40 miles of uh, fungal root structures of the mycorrhizae that, that, that is the main biomass of fungus. Um, hundreds of thousands of, of protozoa, amoeba, um, and up to a billion different uh, bacteria. And you see this diversity. I'm gonna move along through this. Um, just one thing, you know, we'll, while, while we're talking about soil and while we're talking about the importance of, of restoring vegetation, when we're thinking about carbon sequestration, which is going to become a dominant 
talking point, you know, in our careers over the next, you know, say we're going to be working for the next 40 years or so. Um, carbon sequestration almost certainly is going to become a uh, major avenue uh, for, you know, the growth and development of the landscape architects um, and ecologists. So we, this is a, it's a broad estimate, but five to 20 percent of photosynthesis of carbon uh, create a uh, carbon fixed during photosynthesis uh, starches created in plants and um, is transferred into the soil uh, via the root system. So having a deep, healthy, intact root system in vegetation pumps soil into the ground um, where it is permanent, semi permanently sequestered, permanently on on a kind of a human time scale. And so that's just another another reason why we're planting trees. But that's so that that long term carbon sequestration is not happening in the leaves or the wood, you know, the, the stem of the plant, uh, because those biodegrade in a short, very short time period, you know, well within human, human life, lifespans. Uh, but it's that soil carbon that's really kind of on the more permanent time scale. So move right along. Some considerations uh, that we make when planning for restoration. These are real construction documents that we use in our, uh, in our stream restorations and in our, in our stream valley designs. Um, we need to, we create a resource map to guide the decisions that we're making. We identify areas ahead of time that are intact functional communities that are kind of that good, you know, average to good to, to excellent um, rating, you know, for, uh, for kind of ecological function. You know, we take into account presence of deer, we take into account biodiversity, we take into account that there are multiple layers of canopy present. You know, we put about 10 different variables in to come up with, you know, what's a good system. Um, so we, you know, that's one of the major, major roles that I, that I play in our office is to help identify these areas that we need to keep our hands off of, that we, we can't improve this area. Uh, but then we need to include social goals, we need to include cultural uh, cultural resources. Um, there's been a long history of, of, of human residence in all, all throughout this area, um, and so we really do try our best not to interfere with any archaeological resources, whether it's Native American um, or you know kind of the, the settler uh, colonist Americans. Um, so through these resource maps, where we start to plan out where you know existing resources are. You know, we know that we need a trail system. We know that we need access to get to all of these parts for construction and for maintenance. Um, then we can start to put together a plan for how we're going to get there. Um, this is just some diagrams, you know, nothing to look at too closely. Um, but we try to consider this pyramid of biology, of uh, kind of the physiochemical, meaning the, uh, the, the nutrients and the, and the um, chemicals within the soil that are, can be pollutants or can be resources to, to plant growth. Um, look at geomorphology, which is, uh, you know, looking at what the soils and what the rocks are actually uh, made of and how they're functioning. And we look at hydraulics and hydrology, which is how water is moving through these systems. Um, you know, what happens to the system when you get an inch of rain falling on a system? Um, how quickly does the water rise? You know, to what extent is the water rising? Is it getting out into the floodplains, or is it, um, you know, kind of just confined to a narrow channel that's creating erosion and creating flooding problems down downstream? So here's, you know, this is kind of a look at what a what we're what we're hoping to see in a in a a stream channel. You know, this is a perfectly good functional system. Uh, some of the things that we're looking for is woody debris on the ground has been, you know, it's it, almost counterintuitive, almost, you know, um, a little paradoxical to think of dead wood on the ground being an indicator of a healthy system. Um, but so many fungal uh, species, this, this, this fallen wood, and so many arthropods feed on the fungus that's feeding on the trees, so many, you know, higher, higher, more complex animals, birds, amphibians, reptiles. You know, are all feeding on those insects that are feeding on that fungus, which is feeding on that that, that wood. Um, that we really see that we really see the woody debris, dead trees down in in the floodplain, as really being one of the cornerstones of a of a functioning ecological community. Look at perennial vegetation. Um, you know, this is not those stiltgrass and arthraxon. Those are two in 
invasive plants that are annuals that we see, you know, uh, uh, incredible abundance of, we'll say, in, in the kind of urbanized areas. Um, being annuals, they die off usually at the first frost, you know, when weather starts to cool down in the fall, um, and they don't have root systems and they don't have biomass that keeps the soil in place that provides food over the winter for, for ecological communities. So we look for this perennial vegetation as, as being important. Um, obviously, mature trees are great. And then this concept of, of racks, um, which are, you know, is when a natural barrier is collecting uh, debris, leaves, sticks, logs, um, natural traps are kind of created that accumulate all this carbon in the in the floodplain and allow for uh, and, and create habitat for, for insects and, and et cetera. Um, so what we're looking for, you know, we want to create this is this is an ideal system. We want to create this. Um, can't move along because we are running out of time. Um, but just some considerations that we make when we're trying to get there. Um, what kind of plant material are, are you going to use? Uh, we talked, there's all sorts of considerations that go into this from budgeting. You know, we talked about the implications on deer browse. Um, we talked about diversity. We, we, you need to consider what plants are um, readily able to be transplanted. You need to consider what's available within the nursery trade. Um, and then where the source material is coming from. Uh, there's a concept called provenance, um, which is, you know, where the seed source from for, for a given plant uh, was generated. A species like red maple grows from Newfoundland down to Florida. Um, but if you take a plant from Florida, a red maple from Florida, and try to grow its seeds in Newfoundland, it's not going to be successful. Um, there's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity, subspecies, subpopulations that emerge within different ge geographical areas. Um, that can really have an impact, you know, even within the same species. Um, we think about patterning of, of how we're arranging these plants. This is a kind of a normal planting pattern that you see on advocated by Chesapeake Bay organizations, riparian buffer planning. Um, it's shown to not really be successful and not really be how natural forests look, evolve, develop, grow, you know, anything. It's just kind of it's an easy, efficient way to plant trees, um, but really not successful in the long term. And I'm, I'm talking about kind of the even spacing, pseudo random, you know, grid of plants. Uh, so some things that we're experimenting with are these concepts called nucleation, uh, where we plant diverse clusters of trees. You know, these are much closer than what you would see in any landscape architecture, um, you know, urban tree planting handbook or any guide. You know, no one is ever going to tell you to plant trees on three foot space, three foot on center. Um, but, you know, the concept is that you plant five different trees really close to each other. That kind of allows for some natural selection to happen. These are relatively cheap plants. You know, we're paying maybe 10 bucks a piece for them. Um, it's totally fine with us if four of them die and one of them prospers. There's all sorts of microclimates, uh, soil nuances in the soil and in the topography. Um, that can create complexity that can allow one plant to survive, uh, you know, where another one won't. So even, at, you know, in this planting, we planted it at very high densities, but kind of plan on significant amounts of loss over, over a 10, 20 year period. Um, this is a, you know, kind of iteration on that. This is kind of a hypernucleation where we're planting extremely dense plantings, you know, even on one foot on center um, and, and, you know, maybe 10, 15, 16, 20 trees, all of these clusters. Um, and what we're looking at, looking to do here is force competition within these plants, force them to create, to get, um, to uh, put on vertical growth rather than horizontal growth. Because we talked about the, the deer being just an incredible pressure and incredible stress on our systems. You know, we want plants to get tall as quickly as possible to get that growing tip, to get that sensitive top bud out of the reach of deer. Um, and allow these trees to take off. So what we see in these sort of pictures, we call them super clumps. Um, but we see, this is two years later, uh, they put on 10 feet of growth, which you don't really see that in urban plantings typically. You know, this is not a street tree planting, um, but this is a meadow right next to a highway. So it's undergone significant impact, significant compaction. Um, so we look at the picture on the bottom left. This is the clump planting. 
And then this is the randomized kind of control planting. Same site right next to these clumps. Um, these trees have all been browsed. They're probably never going to establish into canopy trees. Um, but right next to there, exactly the same types of species, exactly the same container types, same soil media, you know, same everything else, um, all else being equal, planting them in these clumps together. Um, that in, intra, interspecies, inter um, organism competition, forcing them to, to put on that tall growth, gets them up out of deer range um, and creates the bones of a successful planting. Again, this has been two years on probably a 20 year time scale, but you know, very promising so far. Um, we're running very much out of time. So I'm going to just give you some, uh, actually we'll do some, I'll, I'll get through some string restoration pictures if we have some questions towards the end, but I just wanted to maybe wrap things up with this concept of, again, looking back at what are the goals of what you wanna do within ecological restoration. Um, we refer to the overall goal, you know, long-term big picture, we want ecological lift. That means improvement of all of these different metrics. Um, if all of these metrics can be achieved um, in a measurable, uh, economical, long-term sort of uh, sort of way, then you know we consider ourselves successful. Um, and we, you know, it's not achieved on every single project. But just having all of these concepts in mind when you're working on a design, when you're when you're doing your long-term planning and goal setting, um, can really help you put together a coherent, logical, uh, defensible sort of plan for how you're going to achieve um, the your long-term objectives. So thank you very much. I will leave it at that, and then we can. Uh, I'm happy to take take some questions, and then I'll just go through some examples of some restorations we've worked on, and show you some success stories. Awesome. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? As always, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, um, or you can type your question in the chat, whichever you prefer. Hi. Thank you. Um, I do have a question about um, the trail networks that you create in these restoration projects. Um, sure. So I'm just curious, I'm looking into creating like an ecological network and corridor system for our studio project. And I'm struggling with this idea of how human activity can deter wildlife. And I'm just curious um, if you guys follow any, if you've come up with some guidelines for your trail systems, or do you find that wildlife, gener they kind of get used to people walking through their habitat? Yeah. Well, I think it's important to consider, you know, what wildlife are you, are you, are you talking about? You know, what wildlife are you trying to promote? Um, in urban areas, like where I'm working, you know, almost all the time, we have foxes, we have deer, you know, we have birds, um, raccoons, possums, you know, all of these animals are very well adapted to urban settings. You know, they've become very accustomed to humans being around. There is, you know, almost on a, on a weekly basis, I'll come within range of, you know, I could reach out and pet a deer if I wanted to on these, on these urban trails. You know, these animals are, are typically more adaptable than we give them credit for. You know, even there's bears in, in urban areas in Fairfax. Um, so, you know, I would say that the wildlife that we have is become adapted to humans, human presence. Um, if there's wildlife that you want to reintroduce or there's specific sensitive wildlife that you're looking, you know, looking at, um, you know, that would be a different consideration. Um, but one other thing that that makes me think of on this topic is that we do see, we see changes in the wildlife that are, that are present. We often see improvements in, you know, diversity and, and abundance of wildlife, but oftentimes, you know, I haven't shown kind of the ugly side of a lot of these projects, which is pretty significant construction. Um, you know, to get from this picture on the left to the picture on the right, that's a lot of excavators, that's a lot of digging, that's a lot of moving soil, that's building roads, that's cutting down trees. You know, we're doing a lot of construction work to get to this point. Um, so there are significant disturbances, significant impacts happening on these sites. 
Um, so uh, oftentimes in the short term, we will see changes in the songbird community. So where an area may be dense, you know, dense forest before we start um, that supports a certain assemblage of, of kind of forest dwelling birds. When we're done, it may be more meadow um, and, and edge and shrub thicket sort of habitat. And we'll see an entirely different assemblage of birds come through. Um, so that's something to consider. If you're looking for specific, if you're looking to promote habitat for specific species, um, you really need to consider, you know, how do you get to that particular habitat? What what do they like? What do they like to live in? Do they need wetlands? Do they need mature trees? Do they need standing dead trees? You know, oftentimes we'll try to keep as many standing dead trees as possible for for cavity nesting birds. You know, there's all sorts of those type of considerations. Probably more important than kind of human human, human visitors. Thank you. I have kind of a, a follow up, which is that um, you were talking about the resource map that you guys create. Mm -hmm. And do you do that based on site visits? Do you use maps? Um, I mean, I know that, you know, you can tell where an area is forested, but you can't really tell the quality of that forest just by seeing it on a map. So is it worth marking it for preservation or you know right so yeah we you know we have the luxury i know that you all your studio sites are you know maybe 400 miles away from where you are right now or more if you're remote um so we have the luxury of being able to do as really as much site visits as we want you know we're geographically constrained to one county so all of this would be impossible without getting your eyes on the ground basically um so, you know, you have to make some assumptions as a, as a, as a student, as a, especially working remotely. Um, Google Street View works pretty well. You can kind of see what the canopy layers are if there's a street that goes by. Um, most municipalities, most jurisdictions have historical aerial maps that you can look at. Um, so if it looks like a forest from a satellite view, but you can look at a historical aerial from 1950 and it was all farmland or it was all cleared, you get an idea that this is not an old growth forest. This is a relatively recent regrowth. So kind of you can get an idea of what those land use patterns were. Um, let me think if I have anything else. Um, the this natural community, I think that all of you all are working in Virginia. So Virginia has this. I have maybe, maybe lost it. Um, there's this natural community inventory here we go, that Virginia maintains. And if you all are in my planting design class, we've talked about this um, extensively. Um, but this, the DCR, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, takes data from all over the state, inventorying what species are present in a particular area. Um, so this is all mapped out, um, you know, by county, you know, even even closer than closer um, resolution than county. So you can, if you really, you know, want to dig into this, you can look at your particular studio site, or you know, within say plus or minus 20, 50 miles. Um, and see what rare plants are present there that might support some of the wildlife that you're looking for. Thank you. Um, that was a really informative talk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you measure and define success in a restoration project. And I realize that that depends greatly on the goals that you set out for it. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk and, a little bit about the actual strategies that you use to collect information about a project after it's been done to see how it's working, both like monitoring. Yeah, I do have strategies. Absolutely, and um, and uh, unfortunately, that's the part of the presentation I completely cut out of this because I figured we wouldn't have time to go into it. But I'll give you the very simplified version of it. Um, you know, one thing is the you know the the geomorphology kind of the the base level, and while we're on these pictures, these dramatic pictures, you know, it's an easy thing to talk about. These are the pre-restoration conditions where we have a ravine, you know, a chasm basically, that's rapidly eroding. All this bare soil is full of phosphorus um, that's going, this is five miles from the Potomac River, maybe less. So every time rain comes through, erosion happens and brings nutrients, brings phosphorus into the, into the Chesapeake Bay, um, which is causing all sorts of problems I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, so getting from that to this, already we're, we're doing a pretty good job just from a geomorphological perspective. You know, it does, there are no raw stream banks contributing pollution to the, to the Chesapeake Bay. You know, that is our, that's where it's, I think it's about a hundred million dollar budget for my office. And that's why 
they give us all that money is so that we can reduce pollution to the Chesapeake Bay. All the other stuff, you know, my little group of like four people, um, we look at that ecological lift. You know, the civil engineers are concerned about the shape of everything. If the shape looks good and it's green, they consider it successful. You know, a small group of us are trying to up the stakes, raise our game a little bit. Um, and so we do, there's a practice, we, we just call it eco monitoring, ecological monitoring. Every summer, you know, we'll spend about a day a week in the field, maybe, or, you know, maybe say seven days out of a month in the field, um, where we take about, I'll say 25 different metrics of data um, on a completed restoration site. So we'll take 10 meter square plots where we'll count, measure, identify every tree species, um, you know, get the diameter, get the canopy coverage of, of each of the species. Um, we'll take 10 one meter square plots where we just look at one meter on the ground as intensively as possible, count every species of herbaceous vegetation that we see there and their abundance. Um, that gives us an idea of, you know, not just what species there are, but it'll see, we'll, we get an idea of if is the site being totally taken over by invasive species or are the native species that we planted, you know, um, doing their job. Um, we count that coarse woody debris that I talked about, just having dead wood in the forest. Well, in within our 10 meter square plots, we count how many dead logs are, are on the ground here. Um, and that proves to be, you know, like I said, one of the most useful metrics that we have. Um, this is all, you know, a big construction project. So this is all under kind of performance warranties for our construction contractors. So we take really detailed measurements of where every structure is, where every bend in the stream is, you know, all surveyed and, and located in, in GPS. Um, so we'll come back three years later and see, is this rock structure in the right place? Is, it, is everything kind of stayed where we put it? Um, has there been an appreciable, do we see new bare soil three years later that was not there a year ago? Um, those are just, you know, in a very brief answer, that's some of the, some of what we're looking for. Thank you. Um, Hi, Alex. Quick question. So on your functional targets, you mentioned downstream flooding as one of your, um, of one of the targets. How do you guys accomplish that? What are some of the things that you do to accomplish that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's one of the things that is very interesting to me, and I'm seeing if I have a good picture to show you. So probably this high quality floodplain. Um, so one of the things we do is we build ponds and you know they capture water and store it and let it drain out slowly. That's the, that's the base level. That's what everybody does all over the country. What we're getting into now is the concept of floodplain reconnection. Um, so we see on this picture, the water elevation of the water is very close to the elevation of the floodplain. Um, that means that when we get a heavy rain, the water jumps up out of the banks and spreads out throughout that floodplain. There's exponentially more room for that water to sink in, to soak in, um, to spread out, reduce its energy, reduce its velocity in the floodplain than there is in the stream channel. You know, we think of we think of streams and creeks being very defined pathways that water stays within. That's really a relatively new change. It's only been the case for you know since basically widespread agriculture in the United States. It would have been in, you know, say a thousand years ago, this whole stream valley from, from hill, say there's a hillside on the far left of this picture and a hillside on the far right of this picture, this whole stream valley would have kind of been a wet, marshy meadow that water would slowly move its way through. You know, when we started paving everything and plowing everything and cutting all the forests, that's when water was able to build up the velocity, build up the energy to actually cut these channels through the ground and create defined stream channels. Um, so there's nothing, nothing necessarily sacred or, um, you know, quintessential about a stream channel. They're just kind of what the way that water moves now, and that's what we're just, that's what we deal with. So, you know, water moves very quickly through these channels. If we can get the water up out of that channel into the floodplain. Um, that's us trying to mimic kind of a pre kind of pre-settlement, pre-development sort of condition. Um, and how we achieve that is through kind of check dams. Those are like rock structures um, you can build across it that kind of stop the water until it gets to a certain level and then water can flow back over those. Um, we actually raise the level of the stream bed. So we'll fill pack soil into that stream bed um, to bring it, bring that elevation up higher so that water is 
as you know, it has less capacity and it's the water's more able to get out into the floodplain. Um, and sometimes we lower the floodplain. There's a concept called legacy sediment, um, which is a really interesting concept to me where, uh, you know, when settlers clear cut all the forests and started plowing everything, tons and tons and tons of soil washed off the hillsides and accumulated in the valleys just from gravity. So we see the elevation of these floodplains while the stream channels are dropping, the floodplains are rising from that accumulated sediment. So we'll see sometimes six, four or six feet of accumulated sediment that's gotten, that's moved from the hills down to the valleys over the past 200 years or so. So sometimes we'll just remove that top level of top layer of soil, put it back to kind of a pre-development elevation. Um, and what's really neat about that is that when we remove that new, relatively new soil, sometimes there's existing, the seeds of the wetland plants are still present in that soil. They've kind of been preserved in those oxygen-free conditions for 250 plus years. And so we see rare plants just start to, you know, apparently spontaneously emerging without being planted, just because they're kind of preserved in that, in the muck and in the, in the sediment um, that's left behind there. Thank you. Hey, Alex. Um, does Fairfax County have any programs similar to Montgomery County's Rainscapes program or DC's River Smart Homes program, where the county provides financial incentives to homeowners to plant rain gardens and trees and stuff like that? We should. <laughs> they, they exist. Not, DC and Maryland are almost always more progressive when it comes to environmental programs in Virginia. Um, there's a being a more southern state there's been there's just a intractable kind of concept of property rights like keep the government off my property nobody you know even if we were giving out money nobody would take it um it's politically very challenging you know that is we always look for opportunities to, to partner with private citizens but politically it's been very challenging um so we're not there yet um in my perspective if we could spend as much money as we spend on this big construction restoration project, if we could spend that just spread out in the in the headwaters and the uplands of the of the county, you know, if we could buy old Kmart parking lots and rip up the pavement and plant trees there, um, you know, I think we would have more success. Um, but it's unfortunately our, our our political situation right now where we are confined to working in streams. We have a mandate and we have the budget to the authority to work in streams. Um, some of that goes to federal regulations around streams um, and kind of uh, where authority has been delegated to municipalities on a state-by-state -state basis, really. So there's weird old obscure laws that were made 400 years ago in Virginia that kind of limit us to doing this. Um, so we're working on changing that. But for the most part, we try, we, we, we're allowed to work in streams, so we try to do the best job in streams that we can. Got it. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, I got a question. Um, I wanted to let the students finish up before I uh, blurted out my comments and question. The comment is I really appreciated the deep dive into the deer issue. Like very interesting stuff. Uh, I, I'm actually an avid hunter myself, so I appreciate that. I actually have venison jerky sitting right here <laughs> locally grown organic you know it's and <laughs> there's a i'm in southern maryland and there's deer problems down here there's deer problems in lots of places so, so thanks for that deep dive that was super interesting um you know the problems and challenges with uh restoration in urban areas suburban areas versus rural uh, you know um and then you compare it to like the challenges in rural areas which are just so much different with the with the deer in the suburban areas people are nervous about hunting obviously i mean it there's a large contingent of people that are just afraid pers for personal safety reasons for hunting and then there's an, like the animal welfare uh folks that don't like it as well uh so uh you know I, just as like a little bit of mild self-promotion i'm working on a project with the maryland dnr right now looking at sick of deer hunting uh, in the eastern shore of Maryland. That's an actually a non-native species. Alex, Alex, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it, yeah, it's in uh, Dorchester County in the eastern shore. And 
uh, it's providing all these wonderful outdoor recreational opportunities, including wildlife watching as well as recreational hunting uh, and controlling a non-native species to boot. Uh, and there's all these regional economic impacts from it, but it just speaks to the what you can do in a rural area versus what you can do in a suburban area. Maybe if you're lucky, you can get away with a like a bow hunting program somewhere, but it's inefficient. The deer, they they they're they're smarter than they look. Like when they know when they're hunted too. You, yeah. you mentioned yeah. being able to talk to one. You, you know, if they if they're if there's some even moderate hunting pressure, you might not see them until after dark. So there's all sorts of challenges there. But thanks for that that deep dive. I thought it was really interesting and. You don't yeah, hear a lot. My, oh, go on. Sorry. Yeah. I was just saying it's kind of a an overlooked challenge that we that is an immense right. challenge that that we really have to deal with if we're if we're serious about revegetating these communities. Um, it is, I, in my opinion, I think the predominant challenge. So many more billions of dollars are spent on invasive species, which are a more and a more easily solved problem. Maybe that's why that's where the money's going. Um, but like, yeah, Fairfax County Parks, we allow hunting in most of our parks of, you know, over a hundred acres or so. Uh, but even still that's, you know, 1200 to 1600 deer are harvested a year, just exponentially lower than what we need, where we need to be at. Um, and we're seeing chronic wasting disease. We're seeing all these and the, uh, you know, tick, tick borne diseases. So we're seeing the animal, you know, if we're thinking about animal welfare, you don't want to kill deer from an animal rights perspective. Um, we're really seeing a lot of suffering happening within the population due to them being, you know, basically starving themselves to death um, and creating opportunities for for new diseases um, to to you know slowly kill the herd rather than you know kind of quickly kill kill the kill the herd. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. That the animals you know is is going to die, and if they're at a hundred deer per square mile, like they can be in some of these areas, like they the damage they do to the environment is just incredible. I mean, even like out in my area where I hunt, you mentioned the beech trees. You see beech trees everywhere. You don't see any young oak trees anymore. Uh, they really like to browse on those. So I guess if you think about it in a restoration context, like, you know, be, be aware of the animals that live like where you're restoring like the plants, for example, and <laughs> you might come back and, you know, in, a, in a, a week or two and find them all completely browsed down to the nubs. So. Right. Yeah, we talk about promoting wildlife habitat, uh, but unfortunately, our dominant wildlife that we have is uh, is has a negative impact on what we're trying what we're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Thank you. I had uh, kind of a question and, and comment for you, Alex. Uh, having had a yeah. street restoration project forced on my property in order to allow a developer to develop upstream. Uh, one thing I always look at is restoring the restoration because the damage done sometimes during a restoration project leaves long, long-term damage. But what I've also noticed, and this is kind of a question about taking into account the hydraulics, the energy of water, projecting storm events, the stream restoration project is now several miles downstream into the Gunpowder River because it couldn't handle the flow and the energy yeah. level. And it took whole boulders and and tree trunks and move them down. And this is a first order stream. This is not a big system. Um, yep. So how do you how do you address some of those things? Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's contentious. It's um, in the, we, it, I will say there is increasing political resistance, kind of community resistance to these projects because of the impacts. You know, it, it is a big, there is no doubt that it is a major construction project, you know, that involves removing tons of trees and, and reshaping the earth in a, in a dramatic way. Um, that's what kind of why I focused on kind of the general big picture restoration. But to, you know, go to your question specifically, um, this is a new emerging practice. It's a new science. It's only really been practiced, you know, for 20 years or so. Um, the, the, the technological developments that have been made just in the past five years um, have dramatically changed how these projects are implemented on the ground. Um, that goes to the hy hydrological modeling um, that goes into the into creating these projects by the the engineers that are creating the construction plans. Um, that goes into 
you know, we've exponentially increased the gauges that are present on these streams. So we have a better understanding of how storm flows work. So we know exactly, we really better understand how much water is moving through these streams at a given time so that you can size the, get the right size rocks so that they don't move. Um, the technology and how the structures are built so that they don't, they don't wash away. Um, so a lot of mistakes have been made. You know, I will say that tremendous harm has been done by improperly constructed stream restorations. Um, but it's been exciting just from, you know, I've been in this, I only finished grad school, you know, a couple of years ago and I interned in this office you know, while I was in school. But even in the past four years that I've been kind of involved in this scene, we've made tremendous changes. We're still kind of catching up to Montgomery County. Um, he was in, in DC or, you know, maybe have some better practices than we still do. Um, but I will say it's kind of a developing, you know, on the ground construction practices, um, modeling and engineering practices. And then what my little group that I mentioned, you know, four or five of us in my office, we look at those vegetation impacts. We look at how, how can we achieve these hydrological goals while making minimal impact on natural resources. Um, so I led a study last year that looked at how different species of trees react to the changes in hydrology and the changes in compaction that, that result in bringing this equipment in. Um, so we know that tulip trees, tulip poplars just can't handle the change. Um, so rather than draw a circle on the, on the plans around it that says we're going to save this tree and not cut it down, we may as well go drive straight through it, remove it, don't even pretend to save it, so that we can preserve a stand of, you know, even if there's no large tree, preserve healthy soil, preserve healthy herbaceous plants, um, and create that kind of nucleus for regeneration in the future. Um, so, you know, I'll say it's not perfect, it's developing. You know, I've got a lot of negative things to say about it that I would, you know, say in public. Um, but I, I think that there are improvements happening. Great, thanks. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? It looks like Ellie had a comment in the chat about NINIA campaigns to promote deer hunting. I think they have some of them, at least in some parts of the country already. Um, yeah, like we, I think we kind of touched on it. Most of these urban areas have archery programs, but the more urbanized it is, you know, people are not going to allow rifle hunting. Um, in Fairfax, we let police officers and certain, um, like military veterans are allowed to use handguns. Um, which gives, you know, a little more, you, you get a little more deer harvest, but it's still not nearly at the levels we need. So Ellie, there's actually a, it's kind of nationwide program. They call it R3. It's recruit, retain, and reactivate. Um, and it, it's really focused at hunting and fishing, uh, hunters and anglers, especially hunters because of the dramatic declines in the hunting population that Alex, um, referring to earlier in his in his talk and the resulting challenges we're facing in our forests and and there's other challenges as well with the lower um deer hunter population but there is an active ongoing campaign at the national level and almost all of the states are embracing it including the maryland dnr wildlife and heritage services are embracing it the r3 yeah recruit retain reactivate uh movement so Or you could just come to my house and sit on the front porch and hit him with a stick. <laughs> that works. That works in Loudoun County. I yeah, can they, sit in my in garage the and you know, sit out a window with my cup of coffee in my hand. You you learn to love some non-native species, even if you're a nativist. Yep. Because there's certain sure. things they just don't eat. Exactly. We run out of options. Yep. Um, it looks like Laurel um, posted about an essay in the chat. Oh yeah, that yeah, is a very good essay. I think probably Laurel told me to read that about four years ago. Do we have any other questions? Okay, awesome. Well, it's about um, 6.16, so we should probably be wrapping up anyway. Um, thank you again so much. It was a wonderful lecture. I'd like to okay, thank, thank you all for your time. Go ahead. Did you have some final comments? Oh, no, I, I just uh, thank you all for, for allowing me to present. And um, most of 
of people in this class are my students already. So if you want to talk about any more of this, just just reach out. Or if you're not my student already, you're also welcome to reach out. We appreciate all your support. I wanted to mention that we do have one more lecture in the series next week by our Dean Marian Akers, and she will be presenting the Community Leads Effective Engagement Strategies. So I look forward to seeing everyone next week.